Three weeks ago, we started into this section that's called Paul's Foolish Speech. It's a section where Paul told the Corinthians that like the false teachers they're currently entertaining, he was going to boast about his own accomplishments. However, we're 16 verses into this chapter and Paul is yet to actually boast about anything. Well, he boasted about one thing. He boasted about not taking payment for his work, about delivering his gospel free of charge. He started at the beginning of this chapter, chapter 11, by reminding the Corinthians that he was the one that introduced them to Jesus in the first place. He was the matchmaker. In verses 5 to 15, what we looked at last time, was Paul addresses some accusations that were made against him and against his ministry. Paul was accused of not being a trained public speaker. And he also addressed the accusation, or he addressed the reason why he never took compensation from the Corinthians for the services he gave them. And as we closed last time, Paul exposed the false teachers for what they really are, deceitful workers and ultimately servants of Satan. In the passage we're looking at today, we're going to look at verses 16 to 33. Paul finally engages in boasting. He chooses some odd things to boast about. But he finally engages in this boasting, but not before once again showing that his ministry and the ministry of the false teachers are fundamentally different. Here's how I see this passage breaking down. In verses 16 to 21, Paul gives another disclaimer about boasting. Another disclaimer about his boasting. You may think I'm crazy, but I'm not. In verse 22, in verse 22, Paul draws a line of comparison between himself and his opponents. Verses 23 to 30, Paul boasts. He boasts about his accomplishments and his work as a servant of Jesus. So again, he chooses some very odd things to boast about. And in verses 31 to 33, Paul shows the Corinthians that persecution and suffering have always been a part of his ministry. Hear the word of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to read verses 16 to the end of the chapter. 16 to 33. Hear the words of God. I repeat, let no one think me foolish. But even if you do, accept me as a fool. So that I too may boast a little. What I am saying with this boastful confidence, I say not as the Lord would, but as a fool. Since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast. For you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves. For you bear it if someone makes slaves of you, or devours you, or takes advantage of you, or puts on airs, or strikes you in the face. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. But whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I'm speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I'm talking like a madman. With far greater labors far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, 
in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. And, apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak. Who is made to fall, and I am not indignant. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. At Damascus, the governor under King Artis was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. The words of God. It shouldn't be a secret to you by now to realize that Paul absolutely despises human boasting. He absolutely despises what he's about to do. But he knows that in order to win the Corinthians' attention, he must indulge them in a little boasting. And Paul wants to make it abundantly clear that when he writes, when he boasts, he's not writing as the Lord directs him to write. He's writing purely out of the flesh, purely out of human base instincts. He's going to write foolishly. And again, we have to understand that when Paul says foolishly, he's not talking nonsense. He is simply going to do what the world does. So Paul writes as a fool. He writes as a fool because the Corinthians happily entertain fools. Keep in mind, the Corinthians, they prided themselves on being wise. They prided themselves on being discerning and in a, an ironic and a sarcastic way. Paul writes that even though they are wise, they seem to enjoy putting up with fools. And not just fools. The Corinthians seem to want to put up with leaders who will devour them, who will take advantage of them, who will deplete their resources, who will put on airs around them, who will ultimately just slap them in the face. Now in verse 20, the image that Paul is drawing on is taken directly from Greco-Roman plays, Greco-Roman comedies. In these plays, they would uh, sarcastically uh, and ironically depict a leader, but in an over-the-top way. The character would be arrogant, abusive, and pompous. And the audience uh, sitting there watching this play out on stage would laugh at the over-the-top nature of this leader. It would recognize that the actions of this leader in this play were absolutely ridiculous. But what happened in real life, what happened in real life is that people, even in the ancient world, happens today still. People would end up following this abusive, arrogant, pompous leader. People would end up following this leader even though he did offensive things. Happened in the ancient world. It still happens today. And this is what happened in Corinth. False teachers came into the church and they 
enslaved the Corinthians. They enslaved them to a different gospel. They demanded payment for their services, and so they depleted the resources from the church. They put on airs around the Corinthians. They acted like they were servants of righteousness, but really had no interest in being righteous. And the people followed them anyway. The people followed them anyway. And here, here in chapter 11, Paul realizes that the only way to regain the Corinthians' attention and loyalty is to engage in the same foolish talk that the false teachers employed. We have in verse 21... It's almost as if Paul is saying, here we go, here goes nothing. I'm about to boast. And he begins a boast about his own accomplishments. Though as you heard when we read the passage earlier, Paul chooses some very odd things to boast about. As we make our way into verse 22, Paul actually draws a line of comparison between himself and his opponents. He asks three questions that actually put them on the same plane, on the same playing field. He makes three points of comparison. He asks, are they Hebrews? Are they Israelites? Are they offspring of Abraham? On the surface, all three seem to be asking the same question. And in a way, they they kind of are. But they're also different. Paul is establishing some common traits in order to highlight the difference. He's establishing some commonalities in order to highlight the main difference. Are they Hebrews? Paul asks first. What he's asking in this question is, Are they full-blooded members of the race? Not Hellenistic Jews, not uh, brought, not uh, proselytized Jews, but full-blooded members of the race. Do both of their parents trace their bloodline through the Hebrew race? So does Paul. Both of his parents came from the Jewish race. Paul asks the next question. He says, are they Israelites? And if the previous question was about race, this question is about religion. The members of the Jewish religion. Paul says... So am I. He says it simply here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. But I want to draw your attention to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. Paul says this about being an Israelite. An Israelite. He says this, If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, The people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. And then in verse 7, Paul goes on to say, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Paul's religious heritage is impeccable, much like the false teachers. Remember, he's drawing commonalities here. And finally, Paul asks the question, are they offspring of Abraham? And what he's getting at with this question is, are they members of the faithful remnant of Israel? So is he. Verse 22. 
Paul draws a line of comparison. He shows some commonalities between himself and the false teachers. There is common ground which only serves to widen the difference because as we get into verse 23, Paul asks another question. He says, are they servants of Christ? This is where the commonalities stop. Are they servants of Christ? Did you see Paul's answer when we read it? Paul says, I am a better one. And then immediately says, I'm talking like a madman. I must be crazy to say something like that. He admits that he must be out of his mind. But after making that statement, I am a better one. Most people, Paul's opponents especially, would expect Paul to divulge into a long list of his own accomplishments. It would be expected that Paul would write about the many miles that he traveled in his missionary journeys. It would be expected that Paul would boast about the number of churches that he's planted, the number of letters that he's written, the number of converts that he's made. But what Paul lists in this foolish speech are circumstances that most people would be ashamed of. What Paul lists in this foolish speech is events that society would detest. Imagine this with me. Just picture this. Imagine... Ten and some odd years ago when I was being hired here. Search committee presented my name, Michael. Talked about my education, talked about my life story and history. But imagine they also said this. He's done some jail time. He's done some jail time. He's been charged with disturbing the peace. He seems to cause trouble everywhere he goes. I imagine that if I had that on my resume, I imagine if the search committee presented that to the churches, the vote would have been decidedly different if it made it to a vote at all. Well, it's these shameful acts that Paul chooses to highlight in this foolish speech. It's these acts that society would view as despicable that Paul uses to prove that he is a better servant of Christ than the false teachers. If we want to understand this passage more fully, what we need to do is start with verse 30. Understand what Paul is doing and then read the rest of the chapter in light of verse 30. In verse 30, Paul says this, If I must vote, if I must boast, if that's what you want me to do, if that's the only way that you're going to listen to me, if I must boast, then I am going to do it. But this is what he says in verse 30, but I will boast in those things that show my weaknesses. If I must boast, I will boast in those things that show my weaknesses. Those things that make me look bad. And he'll say in the next chapter that he does this Because when he is weak, then he is strong because the power of Christ rests on him. We aren't going to look at each item in this list specifically. That would be horrific. Quite frankly, a little depressing. 
But I want you to understand what's going on here. At the time of writing 2 Corinthians, there was a a famous document making its way through the Roman Empire. This document was inscribed on monuments. It was a document that was written by Caesar Augustus. It It came to be known as Caesar's eulogy. Only this eulogy was written by Caesar himself. And it highlighted his various accomplishments. When Caesar wrote this, he made sure to include numbers. So it was clear how great he was. How many honors he received. How many battles he won. And so on and so on and so on. Well, well. Paul models his foolish speech after Caesar's eulogy, and he turns it on its head. Instead of boasting about the number of churches that he planted, the number of letters that he wrote, how many miles he traveled, how many converts he made, Paul boasts about imprisonments, beatings, shipwrecks, perilous travels. And he includes numbers, just like Caesar did. It was these experiences that Paul chose to highlight. One, to show that he was a better servant of Christ. Two, so that he would brag about his weaknesses to show the power of God. We're going to look at a couple specific items here in this list, but I want you to realize something. In our Bibles, we have a book called the Acts of the Apostles. And in the book of Acts, chapters 9 to 28, the writer, Luke, describes the missionary journeys of Paul. But what we have to understand is that the book of Acts is not exhaustive. It's not exhaustive. It doesn't detail every single minute detail of Paul's ministry because of the events that we have listed here in 2 Corinthians, only a handful of them are actually mentioned in Acts. The stoning in Lystra is mentioned. One imprisonment in Philippi is mentioned. Paul mentioned, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 11 that he was shipwrecked three times. Well, 2 Corinthians was written before the famous shipwreck recorded in Acts chapter 27. So Paul really went through four shipwrecks in his life. So the events that are listed here, only a handful of them are mentioned in the book of Acts. I want to draw your attention for a few moments today to verses 24 and the first half of verse 25. Paul talks about receiving 40 40 lashes less one on five separate occasions. And in verse 25, he talks about being beaten with rods three times. As Paul writes in in verse 24, the 39 lashes was a Jewish punishment. It was a Jewish punishment. It was a whipping. A three-stranded whip would be used 13 times on its victims. Three-stranded whip times 13 lashes equals... 39 lashes, or 40 lashes less one. How it was given is that one-third of the lashes would be given to a victim's chest. The remaining two-thirds would be administered on the victim's back. It was a Jewish punishment. It was administered under synagogue law. And it was administered for breaking various laws. 
Blasphemy is one of them. Why do I highlight it? Well, this shows Paul's love for his people. It shows Paul's love for his people. It shows a a drive to see them come to know Jesus as their Messiah. Paul was an apostle. He was a minister of the gospel. And in his own words, he was a minister of the gospel to the Jew first and then the Gentile. This meant that wherever Paul would go, whatever city he came to, he would first visit the local synagogue and he would preach there. He would share the good news of Jesus in the synagogue. And that preaching would inevitably upset the religious leaders. Think about it. Paul's desire was for his race to come to know Jesus that he had. So he went to preach to them, but even though he knew that his teaching would get him charged with blasphemy, even though he knew that the charge of blasphemy came with a whipping, he went anyway. He went anyway. Maybe the first time it was a shock to him. But he kept going. And he kept doing it. It was five times at the writing of 2 Corinthians. Were there more? Maybe. But even though Paul knew what was coming, even though he knew that if he went to the synagogue and preached Christ and Christ crucified and raised from the dead, that would upset the religious leaders and that would get him charged with blasphemy and blasphemy would get him a whipping, even though he knew the excruciating pain of the blows, even though he knew the painful recovery as his body scabbed over and began to heal, even though he knew that a visit to the synagogue would inevitably lead to his beating, He went anyway, out of his love for his people and his desire to see them saved. And in verse 25, Paul talks about being beaten with rods three times. This was a Gentile, a Roman punishment. Unlike the 39 lashes, there is no limit on the number of blows. The beating with rods was administered for disturbing the peace. And we know, we know that at least on one occasion, Paul's preaching caused a riot. But even though Paul knew that his Preaching would most likely land him before a magistrate, resulting in a beating. Paul preached anyway. An apostle to the Jew first and to the Gentiles. Paul went because he was compelled to preach. Paul went because he was called by Jesus himself to be an apostle to the Jew first and to the Gentile. So no matter where he went, no matter what people group Paul preached to, he was looking at some sort of physical abuse. And he went and he preached anyway. And if that's not enough... There were numerous other factors as he traveled on the road. Hunger and thirst, inadequate clothing, the threat of robbers, danger on the land, danger crossing rivers. Danger because of false teachers making their way into the church. And if that's not enough, 
Paul felt the pressure and the anxiety of trouble in churches, of seeing churches fall into false teaching. He felt the pressure of, and the anxiety when he saw Christians fall into sin, when he saw churches fall into sin. And again, keep in mind that Paul highlights these career happenings to boast about his weaknesses. You want me to boast? If that's the only way you're going to listen to me, if that's the only way I'm going to win your attention, then this is what I'm going to boast in. I'm going to boast in the fact that I don't charge for my services I'm going to boast in my weaknesses. And this is something that he will continue to do into chapter 12 that we'll look at next week. As he boasts and writes about his thorn in the flesh. And just in case the Corinthians were tempted to think that This was a new development, a new development in Paul's life and ministry, or maybe a product of Paul's own making. Paul takes them back to the first few days in Damascus after his conversion and his call. He writes at the time that he was being hunted in Damascus for preaching about Jesus. He writes that he was chased and pursued through the whole city. The city was locked up in order to find him. And to escape, Paul was let down through a window in the city wall in a basket. The book of Acts tells us it was a fish basket. Oh, the stink. Remember, Paul went to Damascus to persecute Christians. And Paul left Damascus as a persecuted Christian. It was not a triumphant and successful experience. Paul writes all of these low-light highlights to show the Corinthians that there is great power in human weakness. Because when we are weak, that is when the power of God shines through All the more. More on that next week. So how does a list of miserable circumstances and experiences apply to us today? Well, I think this passage draws a contrast between Paul's zeal for gospel ministry and our zeal for gospel ministry. Paul faced hardship and persecutions and beatings and dangerous travel. He faced a whipping if he preached to the Jews in the synagogue and a beating with rods if he preached to the Gentiles in the marketplace. And he went anyway. A few weeks ago, we talked about what drove Paul in his gospel ministry, where the source of his zeal was, what compelled him to keep going. And we learned that it was the displayed love of Jesus on the cross that drove Paul to keep going. Paul faced all of this and more, and he went anyway. Are we that zealous for gospel ministry? Are we that zealous for gospel ministry? We seem to stop dead in our tracks at any minor inconvenience we may experience. We stop dead in our tracks at the thought of ridicule. We don't face the same circumstances that Paul did. And yet sometimes, maybe even most of the time, we lack even an ounce of the zeal that Paul had. 
Paul was compelled by the love of Christ. The love that was displayed on the cross. We see that love. We see the love of Christ displayed for us in the pages of Scripture. It's a love that tells us to go into the world, make disciples. Hearing and reading about Paul's hardships, yet knowing about his faithfulness, should cause us to take a long, hard look at our gospel zeal and become compelled to take the gospel with us wherever we go. Paul's foolish boasting is a reminder that God uses the things that this world thinks foolish to reveal his power and his strength. Paul experienced all of this and more, yet he was still a successful missionary, a successful church planter, a successful pastor. It was because Paul recognized his own limitations and his own weaknesses that he relied on God's strength to see him through. It's that lesson on relying on God's strength that we all desperately need to learn today. And it's a topic that we are going to explore more when we look at chapter 12 next week. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the way that you work. God, I thank you that you display your power through our weaknesses. God, I pray that you will help us to recognize this is the way you want us to live, relying on your strength, relying on your power to see us through, not doing things on our own and in our own strength and energy, but relying on you. God, I pray that you will fill us with gospel zeal. We will have a passion to see the people in our lives come to know Jesus as their Savior. I pray that the love of Jesus will compel us, that we just can't help share the gospel with people. I pray for the week in front of us, that you will provide opportunities for us to share the good news, that we will have open ears and open eyes to see and hear. You'll give us boldness and confidence to share the gospel with the people that you put in our lives this week. I pray that we will go in your blessing and your peace. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.